Greetings to all of you who are on Skype. We have a nice little list here. Appreciate your hunger for the Lord. Am I feeding back? Is that why you're doing this? Amen. <laughs> all right. Um, we're in, uh, what, what class is this? This is Genesis 15, right? If I uh, look tired, like I told Chris today we met, I said, if I look tired, it's because I am. <clears throat> he said, How, how'd your day go? And I said, well, I got underneath the sink, and I had to fix the pipes, and, you know, this, it's all dripping down on you and stuff like that. And then I went out in the yard during the heat of the day, not the highest heat, but certainly I cut a bunch of branches back and helped the... Um, the guy who checks your meter for your gas, he couldn't get to it and was afraid of our dogs, so I had to cut, cut away. So. so it's been a good day. Amen. Got some things done. Amen. Okay, so we're in Genesis 15 and we're hungry. And we want the Lord. And we're not playing around. If you are, you, you can be dismissed. It's fine. There's, you know, praise God. Amen. So um, one of the things that we talked about prior to this was that we talked about um, the verses in which um, uh, God took, well, <clears throat> first of all, um, we talked about how uh, in the 14th chapter, with, you know, what was it, 138 men, servants, not even men. He defeated several kings in their armies. That happened by the hand of the Lord. We can, we can have enemies come against us, and we can have the hand of the Lord deliver us, and not one ounce of that brings glory to the Father by his crucified son not one ounce of that it, it helps us okay and he's real good at helping Israel if you remember Exodus 12 but his desire is to bring out the firstborn <clears throat> let my firstborn come unto me um, and um, and if you remember way back in Exodus 12 that was a hard cry of a father who said you know you my son is all bottled up, you know, and in bondage and all of that. And uh, we, we, we termed even us as Pharaoh and as Egypt who have the son in us, but we, the, the firstborn son is in us, but we bottle him up and we uh, call upon him not as the firstborn and we um, want him to help and do things and, and we want the father to do that but not really in relationship to his firstborn son the one thing that will truly move the hand of God we talk about prayer that moves the hand of God how about a prayer that is that will help him receive his firstborn son out of his body you know because whatever whatever Israel did whatever Egypt did and as it were bottling up the son down there in Egypt uh, he certainly wasn't with the father because that's not how they related to God and that was not how they um, uh, what they even it wasn't even in their minds probably wasn't even in their mind about firstborn son and that the father wanted that but uh, as I said, if you want prayer that will move the hand of God, start praying that, you know, instead of you, it will be him. Instead of uh, him helping you all the time, like he did Israel, and he did all the way through the wilderness and continued to do that in the land, but <clears throat> in every case. Um, and if you want to see that more clearly, even what was the, the Zadok series? I guess that's what we call it. Is that what we called it? The Zadok series. Um, which some of you never even, well, none of you, I guess I gave you copies so that you could work on it, but nobody else got 
several of the ending chapters that summed everything up and put it in a little better picture. But um, uh, even that has to do with the firstborn son, see? Because if it has to do with the priest, guess who God made the, the, the firstborn? He made the Levites. And even then, then it divided into Israel, as it were, and the firstborn son. And Zadok and his sons were in relationship to the firstborn. So there is, there is this thing about the father. That we call him God. There is this thing about God. But it's not just God. I mean, it's the father in relationship to his son. And it's his son in relationship to the Father. And it's the Holy Spirit in relationship to the Son to glorify the Father. And the, on and on and on. It's, a, it's a, a living dynamic of our God. And we don't know hardly anything about it. We know all about, you know, the book of so-and-so. We know... I know what I'm saying. We we know all about that, and we know about you know um, how to minister on the streets, or we know how to do a children's church thing, or whatever. You know. Well, anyway, um, you read in Genesis when he didn't get that which was after his kind, his image, that he said, I'm sorry that I made you. You'll remember that. I'm sorry that I made you. And it grieved him at his heart because he had lost that image, that firstborn that he desired out of mankind. And I don't know how you read that without you just not almost crying. I mean, seriously, I don't know how you can read that. If you understand it, I can understand how you could read it and go, oh, this was sad because sin had taken over the world. It wasn't a matter of sin. It was a matter of he had no longer after his kind. And it says what in the sixth chapter, which begins the Noah thing, that, that God made Adam, I think this is the first couple of verses maybe, God made Adam in his own image and and he produced sons after, Adam produced sons after his image. And out of all that sprang everything that grieved God at his heart, grieved the Father. We know it to be the Father. See? We know it to be the Father. Well, it's, and, then, and then again, it's one thing. It's one thing if that grieves we can read those scriptures in Genesis and see it and, and be moved by that. It's one thing that that can move us. But when can we see it within our own life and see we're not giving him his firstborn and not, not understand that he's going to be grieved again because he's not getting one after his kind and not cry out and say, God, do what it takes. Stick me in an ark, a dark ark, a stinky ark, whatever it takes. Do what it takes to, because why? Because I want, no, no, not because I want, but because you want. You know, we say, because I want this son. Okay, great. That's great. How long is that going to last? Or you know what I'm saying? What, you know, but he wants the son. And you tune into that. And so, so I think on some level, uh, Abram must have, in, uh, coming out of 15, where, you know, God says to him right after the great victory, you know, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward, uh, that something was already working in Abram toward that son. Because we can call it the seed, and the scriptures call it the seed, but God says, my son, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's his view. That's his heart. That's, his, that's the way that he views it. So 
Yes, it is the seed. The seed is the son. Yes, it is the firstborn son. Yes, yes, yes. But those are all connecting facts that make us think we have more than we have instead of having the heart of, of God in it. Connecting facts don't move your heart. They won't. They won't move your heart. Comprehending that the God who made all things isn't really that into all things. <laughs> you know? That he wants all of that to praise him by his son, if you will. And so, so Abram, on some level, grasps that and he said, you know, but, but where is the, basically, where is the son that you promised? And, you know, there's a, a, a conversation that goes along with that. We know about the stars, which it really wasn't about the stars. I mean, you remember that, though. God takes him out and he shows him all the, basically, you know, the universe. And he says, you know, if you can count these stars, so shall my seed be, basically, to you, because you can count them all. But he's saying, the Father's saying, but I can count them one. <laughs> it's Christ. It's his son. One, all of that, and, and someone says, you know, someone says, well, all of that represents all of the people that will, you know, have the sun shining through them. And I say, you know, if you can count all the stars, I don't think that there's going to be that many people that have let the sun shine through them. But th I mean, think about it, because he, he shows the whole universe. Okay, all, you know, and there's not going to be that many, not that many. There's not even going to be that many people alive. The universe is like way bigger than the earth. Can you understand that? <laughs> I'm trying to put this in perspective somehow. There's just no way it's not going to happen. God sees his son, one son. All of it is the same. It's the same brightness to him. It's the same reality. It's the, the glory of his son that he's trying to communicate. And, and, then, and then Abraham says, whereby shall I know? Whereby shall I know? Okay, you know what that tells me? The, when, when God showed... Abram that, and he, he didn't look at the stars and go, okay, one, two, three, four, you know, I'm going to get the sun, five, six, because, you know, if you can count them all, so shall my son be seven, eight, I'm going to get the sun. What a long path that's going to be. You understand what I'm saying? What a long path that's going to be. So he turns and he looks at the father's heart in relationship to the son, and he believed God, not the stars, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Counted to him for righteousness. Well, that's good. That's, what is that? That's Romans uh, 3 and 4. <clears throat> but do you, are you familiar with Romans like 5 and 6? You know, in other words, being counted to you for righteousness is like you just sort of, you got it one point for you, you know, along the way. I mean, it really is. We could go into this, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you <clears throat> that I think that that Genesis account, when, when he came back from that, Abram immediately came back from that and said, whereby shall I know? The Lord went, okay, let's instead of talking Romans 4, let's talk Romans 6. Romans 6, anybody familiar with that, baby? It's a good one. Because it's counted to you for righteousness, but you're not righteous. Do you understand? You're, you know, it's imputed to you. It's not imparted to you. It's imputed. It's put on your account. That's the 
true Greek meaning of that in Romans. It's just put on your account. You're no different. You, and the Lord knows that. And, and, um, and I think, again, that we're getting that picture when God does that and then it's counted to him for righteousness. And then Abram says, whereby shall I know? He's, the scriptures are screaming to us, there is more that needs to come if we're going to have this. I think, it, I think genuinely it's there for that reason. I think that's exactly why God allowed him to ask and why, why Abram was more in tune than most Christians because he's going, I need more than your hand moving and giving me the victory and doing this and doing that and being all this stuff to me but not in me. And uh, um, I still don't have the seed and this is good and I believe your heart toward your son, but I'm still devoid of life. Well, you say, well, prove that, Randy. Well, the best proof I can give you is God's answer to that. Remember? His answer was, go get me all the basic the sacrificial animals and bring them here and make an altar. And you make the altar. You make the altar. I did the stars. You make the altar. You know, I did the victory with 138 men, servants. You build the altar. You bring the sacrifice. And if it's the right sacrifice, I'll send the fire. I'll take care of that. So I think in that sense, too, God is saying to him, because that whole conversation happened without an altar till that moment. It all happened without an altar. So again, I, this is where we left off, I think. I don't know. You know, you know that he's, he's talking to God, and he's saying, you know, well, you know, I, I have no seed, and da 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 da. So he takes him out and says, Sure, stars. And then he says, Whereby shall I know? And he goes, Okay, that's enough of this. That's enough of this. You need to know if you're going to communicate with me, you need to go through the altar. Now, I don't know how much we all believe that. I really don't know how much we all believe that. I, I'm serious. I, you know, and I'm not doubting you. I'm just saying I think there's, I think we're like, some of us are like Abram. We're still whereby and shall I know. And God's having to go, look, it's the altar. Build me an altar. No, no, just teach me. No, no, build me an altar. I don't want to teach you this. I, as it were, taught you with the stars. And then you looked at me and then you really got the answer, not through the stars, which was good. But I do not want to just talk like this, you know. Um, so everything, everything is supposed to go through the altar. Well, okay. I'm pulling this mic loose. Is that all right up there? Did we just knock everybody's ears out on the on the thing? Okay. Aye, aye, aye. Take her down, baby. I'll get close, okay? <clears throat> All right, let's see. How shall I draw this? Okay. We gotta have an altar, right? Okay. Okay, now how? How shall I draw this? Let's see. Everything. Christ. This is all in Adam. Which includes everything. This includes. This includes. Uh, <laughs> this includes cussing. And um, let's see. 
getting drunk and uh, talking to God without the cross. <laughs> okay? It does. There is nothing God wants to hear from you or me from out of this. And there is no in this, which represents Christ. There is no in this without the altar. That's not possible. There, okay, let's talk about Christianity. See, now you got me mad. Not really, I'm not mad. But I'm just, you, know, you know, there is no Christianity without the cross. Do you agree with that? I think every Christian would agree with that. Boom. But it's not the cross of 2,000 years ago. It's the cross of our own crucifixion. Do you understand that it's not just, yes, 2,000 years ago this did it, and therefore I must be in here and functioning by that. No, you never put anything to death. You never built an altar. You let him, you let Jesus build an altar 2,000 years ago, but you never built an altar in your heart in relationship to that altar that still, you know, okay, sorry. I don't know what's wrong with me tonight. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, okay? So he didn't say I'm, you know, I am I was crucified with Christ. He uses the word am. I don't remember what perfect. Yeah, say it again. Perfect tense. Perfect tense, which means it's a past, a past finished work having bingo present results in us today. A past finished work having present results. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ and it is impacting me to this day, I am. It's still impacting me. Okay, he's not just saying, okay, so he's, the Holy Spirit's a wild man tonight. He's not, you know, okay, so we're, we're saying, well, it impacts me today, too. It impacts me every day. I thank him that I'm saved. I thank him, okay, well, I don't want to go there. How did you get saved? By being crucified with Christ, you know? But he didn't just save your flesh. He saved you as one with him. It is not, it is not the... Um, here's a picture God says build me an ark build me a big one because we're forget the animals we're going to try to stuff all these sinners in there <laughs> you get it we're going to stuff all these dead people because in the mind of God they're already dead with no life after resurrection we're going to fill this boat up with dead people. And they're going to worship me in their death, in that kind of death. No, no, no. He, he killed them, <laughs> okay? And he guess what? He killed the ones in the ark, too. He did. Now, I'm not, it's not my, <laughs> I'm not going to teach Noah again here. But that's, that, there was a death that took place there. There could be no resurrection. There is no new creation. Everything is touched by death, folks. Everything. We say, well, the Christians aren't. I am crucified with Christ. <laughs> Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. I don't live. Christ lives in me. So everything has to pass through death. Everything, everything goes, as it were, Jesus becomes the Lamb of God and he takes all of this to the cross and everything goes down with the Lamb. Okay? Everything does. 
See, a lot of what we say, well, yeah, well, it didn't take, yeah, it did too. Yeah, it did. They're dead already. Did you know that before you got saved, you were already dead? You were dead in sin. We say, well, yeah, but I was still alive. No, you were dead to God. You were spiritually dead. You were not just a foreigner in that sense. You were dead to God. <clears throat> well, how do you become alive unto God? Through Jesus Christ. You know, you know that scripture? Alive unto God through the instrumentality of Jesus Christ. Okay, so the instrumentality of this thing is that he takes all of this and he brings it into death and only that which will come up in him is, as it were, raised unto newness of life. Hmm, Romans 6. Hmm, that's not Romans 4. Hmm, what's going on here? Are you changing my book, Randy? Are you switching the chapters here and there? No, this is the order. This is the order. This is the exact order of Genesis 15. That's what I'm trying to tell you, is the fourth chapter says, you know, this is reckoned unto you. It is counted unto you. It is put on your account. It was a, a uh, legal term. What do you call it when somebody keeps track of all that stuff, you know, in the, in the books, they do the books? What? Accounting. It's a, it was an accounting term. We're putting this on your account. You're not changed at all, ultimately, until you reckon yourself dead. Where's that at? Romans 6, okay? So righteousness is put on your account, but it's imputed to you. It's not imparted. Romans 6 brings us to a whole nother place. You are, let's put something else on your account. I reckon you're dead, <laughs> Because you are dead. I put it on the account. It's in the books. This is God speaking. You're dead. Paul sees it and goes, I'm dead. And then he says to the Colossians, for ye are dead. <laughs> you know? It's, it's not complicated, but it's complicated to us if we haven't seen it from the Lord. But it's there, and if we don't see it from the Lord... I don't, I don't know what that means. I don't, see, I don't, I'm not into fear. I'm into Jesus. I just want Jesus, you know. But I do preach Christ in this manner because I believe that this is what he said do. This will, you know, how shall they hear without a preacher? So, anyway. Um, so, you remember Jesus said, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You remember my little picture of that before, not on the board, but talking. Jesus standing here, and we're here, and, and Jesus says to the person, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he goes, you're my way, and you're my truth, and you're my life. And he goes, no, nobody comes to the Father. I'm the way to the Father. I'm the truth of the Father. I'm the life in relationship to what the Father wants. No man comes to the Father but by me. Oh, I thought that related to salvation. <laughs> I thought that was only a thing, you know, that got me saved. You're the way to the Father, and if I'm with the Father, I'm in heaven. That's Christian mentality. He's going, no, no, I am the way to the Father, and the Father in the, being the bigger picture here, I am the way, and guess where I'm going to take you? The my way, you know, someone said to me once, my way or the highway? And I said, my way is the highway. God said, Jesus says, my way is the cross. That's my way. No man can get over here except through Christ crucified. So this is Christ crucified speaking over here when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You're not getting to the Father except by me. And I'm going to go to a cross, and I'm going to crucify you, and I'm going to be your life. You know, so you go, 
is there anybody else I can talk to? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know he's, he's like, no, the Father and the Holy Spirit are pretty much set on this too. This is kind of the plan we came up with before the foundation of the world. So this is, this is it, you know. So um, uh, oh, I just jotted down the scripture, First Corinthians. What is it? Two one. I didn't even remember if it was two one or two. Um, Paul said what? He said, "For I am determined not to know anything among you save Christ and Him crucified." Okay. It hit me. It hit me this time when I was thinking about it. Oh, my Lord, look at him. Go, Paul, marvelously drive away the fowls of the air, the vultures from off of the sacrifice. Drive everything else. I'm determined not get off. I'm determined to get away from here. I'm determined to know the altar. I'm determined that if I'm going to talk to the Father, it's going to be through this altar. And that's what the Father's saying. He said, there is, there's nothing. There, don't talk to me in Adam. If you're going to talk in Christ, then every, okay. So everything over here that we would try to present to God or whatever is crucified. Do you agree with that? Amen. That's good. On Skype, do you agree with that? You're not nodding your heads. Never mind. Um, but guess what? I have a surprise for you. <laughs> you ready? You like surprises? Do you? Well, this isn't a birthday surprise. Okay, this is a death. This is a death day surprise. The reality is, see, we can understand everything over here is dead, but everything that passed through here, if you're going to pray, if you're going to pray, if you're going to pray, because we're talking about Abraham talking to God, right? Without the altar. If you're going to pray, this prayer, see this little tiny cross on that prayer? Everything has already passed through death and will always have the touch of death on it. If it's Christ crucified, if that's who your life is, if it's a lamb of God, if that's who your life is, everything in there, we could, you know, any little subject you want to put it on here, everything has the touch of the cross that definitely touched it. There is nothing in there that we can go, oh, you know, well, this slipped through, Jesus. You know, would you get me a Cadillac, you know, <laughs> or something dumb, you know. Ridiculous. Everything. Okay, so that means that when you preach, the touch of death. When you, when you lead worship, the touch of death. When you sing a special, the touch of death. It has to be there. Or if it's not there, then, see, we may be waiting for God to go, hold up there, Skippy. Um, build me an altar like he did Abraham. But instead, you know what he does? And this is the honest truth. He points us back to the scripture and says, I'm not going to repeat myself. It's here. This is my word. If it happened to Abraham, if it, if it was good for Paul and Cyrus, Silas, it's good enough for me. <laughs> Give me that old time religion. No, don't. Um, but th we're, that's what we're talking about is that touch of death on everything because the, the living reality of it is a lamb slain, okay? So it's not just, you know, it's not just our prayers. See, we think, well, God gave, us a, God gave us all the right to just pray, and we can pray for any old thing, and, you know, and, you know, I'm not going to go through what I've shared many times on uh, come boldly before the throne of grace and find help in time of need and whatever, you don't want to hear me saying all that right now, tonight. Um, but that's, that's wrong. It is, it is a wrong approach. Our approach is wrong. We act as if this creation was not put away. Okay. The Holy Spirit's really having fun tonight in my 
spirit because he's bouncing all over the walls, I'm telling you. The world. Okay, let's do that. The world. Okay. The world, let's put it, well, we need to put it as a square. Here's a square inside the big Adam square. The world, let's see, put another one over here with an F inside with the flesh. Uh, another square, the devil. Uh, the... Uh, um, the old nature, which is this, it's included in this. So what we're doing is we're looking at all the things that Christians are fighting with. The world, the flesh, the devil, right? This is, oh, we're doing hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yeah, God gave us all authority to do hand-to-hand -hand combat. Folks, hand, the hand-to-hand -hand combat is supposed to be based on a finished work or a death. Paul knew that. And Paul, um, uh, when it came to the devil, or whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, through death he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Okay. So now it says, now you have authority over the devil because there has already been a victory. But that victory took place when all of that went to the cross. All of this, okay, the flesh, the flesh, okay. Well, Scriptures talk about the lust of the flesh and all of that stuff, and it has been crucified. What is it? Uh, Galatians 2, 22 through 4. Let's just go with that. Um, um, the old man. No, you're not. The old man is crucified. Anything that we're wrestling with, if we're dragging it over here into our life, we're the only circle without a cross in it. And we're going, and what are we doing? We're looking to God up here somewhere. God, not the Father. God, help me defeat these things that Jesus already took to the cross. And our death won that victory so that now we can live by Christ. Okay? So the victory is Christ and him crucified. Christ and him crucified, see. So if we're ignorant of that, then we're just saying, give me great power over the devil, you know. So let's put the devil at least outside of him over here. But we, you know, give me great power over the devil. He's big, he's strong, but you've given me authority over him. Yes, he has. The, okay. When a... When you become a police officer, they give you two things. They give you a gun, and they, that's called power, and they give you authority. That's called a badge. You agree with that? Okay. So you have authority and power. Okay. The authority is that all has been settled in Christ and that he is now what the Father wants out of us as a sweet savor, okay? So that would mean, um, that would mean, let's, Holy Spirit wants to have some fun with y'all tonight. So that would mean, let's see, uh, what is it, Second Corinthians 12, is that where God sent a, a messenger of Satan to buffet Paul? Anybody ever read that before? Okay, we're going, oh my God. Wait a minute, God sent him? He's the one who's supposed to give me authority over it. So Paul prays three times. Lord, remove this from me, right? Remove it. God doesn't do it. God says, my grace is sufficient. Your grace, your grace would take this away. Grace always takes everything away. Grace makes everything better. It's like peanut butter. Goes with everything. <laughs> For those who like peanut butter and aren't allergic to it, <laughs> men will kill you. Anyway, so we're, you know, we're assuming that 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 God, because we've been taught that grace is meant to uh, cover everything and particularly our mess ups. Okay, 
It's, it's meant to, to take away our mess-ups. Well, most of our mess-ups are either the result of the world, the flesh, the devil, or something else that was dealt with at the cross. And all of those refer to the cross that dealt with them. Amen? All of those are saying that it was the cross that dealt with them. So, what, you know, so we're, we're ignoring the cross. We're ignoring the work of Christ in his death. Um, and we're just calling upon him like Abram did, you know. Well, you know, you've given me no seed. Well, you know, actually, he's on the way. But I can't give him to you right now when you want him because you're too strong. Well, I'm, you know, I'm 75 years old. I think he's actually 85 at that point, if I'm not mistaken. And God says, no, you're going to need to be, you know, like, you know, around 100. You know, so that you absolutely know that this came from me. And then you didn't get it because you believed in grace. We need to quit believing in grace and start believing in the cross and in a gracious God who dealt with not only those, because you remember all these little squares over here in Adam? There's also another one that's called I. World, flesh, devil, I am crucified. Okay? Okay, so what do we got going on here? Let's look at what we got going on. We got a war going on in Adam between I and the devil or I and the world. Or I, You see what I'm saying? It's like, well, we got authority over you, Satan. He's going, not over here you don't. You know what I'm saying? Not over here, you know. If you're going to live over here, you're still in my territory, you know. And it's, if you're not going to be crucified, guess what? You belonged to me before that. You still belong to me. I can mess with you anytime I want. Well, I prayed three times. He goes, well, I'm still here. <laughs> you go, what's wrong? I must have a wrong understanding of grace. My grace is sufficient for you. That's, what, that's God's response. He never responds the way we think. You know why? Because he thinks based on the altar, and we think based on what religion has taught us. <laughs> so, so we have Paul come along, and Paul's going, mm, man. I'm crucified with Christ. There's Galatians, Romans. Uh, you know, the old man is dead. Reckon yourselves dead. He that is dead is freed from sin. That was the other one I wanted to put in this empty box here. Sin. Okay, world, flesh, sin, devil, and I. We're wrestling with that and Paul he's going he's he's digging into the word but he's doing more than that you got to understand that you got to understand we say well because he was a Pharisee he knew the scriptures and and then they just you know they just popped out to him just came alive no because he sought the heart of God he found the heart of God in this stuff this wasn't just deep truth because he knew the scriptures the Pharisees he was a Pharisee. So were all the rest of them. Why didn't they get it if they knew the scriptures? I mean, when the heart turns to the Lord, you know, is what the scripture says. And his heart turned to the Lord and he began to declare things that are not just Christian things. He began to declare things that are Christ and in the Christ that the Father wants, which is this firstborn son which the Messiah is that you know the Messiah is that oh gosh there's so much he's just I mean it's like a it's like I've got a dove at the top of my ark here fluttering around there's there's too much so 
But I mean, it's not anything we haven't heard. But Paul is, is he's getting this, and, and instead of um, it being a dove fluttering around, Paul is seeing that everybody around is like a vulture, is like a fowl of the air that are trying to get me off of the cross, off of the altar, and God allowed them to. God said, build me an altar, do it just before nighttime so the hungry beast will come out and all this kind of stuff, you know what I mean? And put dead stuff on there which will draw them. And you're going, that's the devil, that's not God. No, that's God, that's our God, you know? Why? Because when they start coming, Paul starts going, no, I'm determined, get out of here. I'm determined not to know that. Get out of here. We could say, well, the fowls of the air are, are nothing, but, uh, nothing but the devil. But what if it was determined not to know anything? Anything. Anything. I'm, it doesn't have to be uh, directly from the devil or this or that. I want to know Christ and him crucified. You say, well, how do I know what's what? Yeah. Did you really just say that? <laughs> How do I know what's what? You don't. You don't need to name the fowls of the air. You know, here's Bob, and he's bringing this. You know, you don't have to. You don't go through all of that. I'm determined to know the altar. You see that? You, anything else? You know, well, there's an American eagle. Get the heck out of here. And I'm sorry. Yes, I'm patriotic. I was in the Army. I almost died for my country. <laughs> well, I did, but it was my country who was going to kill me. Anyway, that's another story. Um, and so, you know, so he's, he's determined, and he's, you know, he, he's, um, the altar is growing in his heart. And this is, it's from that that he, he comes up with, I'm crucified to the world. That's his words. I am crucified unto the world. You know, anybody here, be honest, raise your hand. Anybody here ever felt the tug of the world? Raise your hand. And I guess, I guess in most cases you probably, yeah, beat them off, didn't you? You know? Yeah, you know, I mean, you didn't just go, I, I'm going to spend my life wrestling with this one foul. <laughs> and he's really foul because he keeps tugging on me. You know, you, when, see, if, it, if, if the goal is just this, God puts you in the middle of a field and all these fouls are going around and the goal is just to beat up fouls of the air, you know. Get you a buzzard beater and beat them all to shreds. So, you know, but they keep coming, but don't worry. At the end, God will shoot you out of that field and just shoot you straight up, and there won't be any buzzards up there. Okay. But that's not what's going on here. This is, this is an altar. This is God's son. This is the giving of his son. He gave him. He offered him up. And he's wanting us to go, you know what? Yeah, I mean, I know Paul did that. And maybe it wasn't just once, but, you know, in other words, there's a process. But I think he just went, you know what? I am determined. So the world? No. No. Bam. You know, the flesh? No. Bam. You know, um, uh, the, you know, your, your best friend, you know, dude, we got a lot of fun that we need to have before you, you know, start dying yourself to an altar, you know what I'm saying? I know what I'm saying because I had friends that said that. I brought them over to the house, said, I'm going for God with all my heart, and they said, uh, you know, you? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I, I love Jesus, and this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. And, and they said, well, 
how about we all try Buddha together? That's what they said. How about we all just, you know, because Buddha be, sounds cool in the 60s. <laughs> Jesus probably never sounded cool, except for in the 60s when the Jesus movement happened. And I said, no, we're not. I went, you don't understand. <laughs> I'm just trying to pick some God here. And, you know, I said, he came into me. He's my life. This is who I am now. This is how I'm going to live. This is what I will do the rest of my life. Well, they walked out, and some of them said, oh, this is a fad. Randy will be back. He's coming back. Don't worry. Oh, no. No, he ain't coming back from that death. No, no, no. And he still hadn't. Still hadn't. So, Paul basically is saying, you fowls of the air, you will not take the cross from me. You are not going to do it. I, and I, I remember one of the things, I do, I just, the Spirit of God brought it to my remembrance. I remember when I was in Bible school and there were these pulls, and I had several that I won't mention, but there were these pulls. And, and, uh, uh, and so when I would feel something or something would come my way or whatever, I would say uh, out loud to myself, praise God, this is, this is helping me to understand who I am and what I want to be. And I would dig into the word. I mean, I would get into the word even harder. And then I would go share with everybody even harder. And, and you say, well, why would you do that? And you say, well, because I wanted the enemy to know that every time he hit me to deter me, that I was going to come on even stronger every time. Every time, every time. I wasn't going to fall in a heap or I wasn't going to, I was going to go, I'm, I'm going even more. Yes, I'm determined. Yes, Lord, you know, and going for that altar. And I think, this is my opinion, I don't really have a lot of problems with the devil. I haven't for a long, long, long time. But I think that he kind of figured out, we're going to have to try something different on this guy because he, every time we hit him, he doesn't fold like a lot of people do. He goes even harder. And we don't want him harder and stronger for the Lord. Let's leave him alone and maybe he'll just fizzle out. Psst. I didn't fizzle out. I died. I died with Christ. I know it's true. I know that that's more true than I know that there are people in this room. Do you believe that? Maybe you don't. I believe that. I know that that is more true than there are people in this room. I know that that, uh, again, I say it all the time, that world created this world. That world is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I guess he's got a bunch of angels too, but that world is God to me. That's everything. He is, not the angels, God. And and he created this world, and I'm not fooled by the props at all, not even a little bit. I am not fooled by the props. I am not. I know what's real and what will last. And, you know, even the scriptures say, and in the end, it'll all be rolled up like a, like a big curtain or something. What is the word? That it, what? Scroll. Like a big scroll, and then all of a sudden you go, ah! Yeah. You know, and it won't be heaven that you'll see. You'll see what created the heavens and the earth. You see what I mean? I want to go to heaven. He created it. I want to go to Jesus. I want to go to the Father by Jesus. I want to go s spend time with the Holy Spirit, like eternity time that is not time at all, with the Holy Spirit going Let's talk about the Lord. You know, you're going, okay, dude, you're really into this. And spend eternity just laughing and crying and 
brokenhearted and, and thankfulness to the highest degree, all of it in knowing the Lord and seeing him. But the one thing, and I'll end with this, the one thing was this. My life at home was so horrible and nightmarish, and, and, I, and I, you know, that's not an exaggeration. That when I found the Lord, or the Lord found me, because that's really the truth, I had no thought of, oh goody, I'm going to heaven. I had no thought of, praise God, I'm saved from hell. I knew that something different happened in me and it was another life. And I grew into the knowledge more and more of that, that it was another life. And I knew what the world was, at least my world, and what I was in that world, and it wasn't saintly either. And I knew one thing. I don't care about heaven and hell. I need to get out of this hell that's my life and then my life me. What I'm living in the midst of and what I was. And I knew, and I knew this, I knew that if that didn't change, if I just went to heaven, if that didn't change, that whoever my wife would be, whoever my kids would be, they would probably be thrown in the same hell, but I would be the one doing it to them that I went through because I didn't know any better. That it would, be this, it would just be the cycle going over again. And I could not stand to think of perpetrating such things, especially now that I can see, I can see him enough to see the contrast of how he is. I couldn't stand perpetrating on that on the people that I loved, you know, the, you know, because that's where most of it happened was supposedly on people that you loved. And I said, God, because I didn't know any better, God, I need a change in my life. I need your son the way that he is, that was the beauty. That was the attractive. That's the, I need that kind of life in here. And if I don't get it, I don't want to live. I don't need to live. I need to be like a rabid dog. I need to be put down. That's the way I felt. I, I still can't look in a mirror. You know? I need to be put down. And I felt that with all my heart. And in and, and times still, when I go through stuff, if I get to a place where, you know, something really gets to me, I know that the cross is the only answer for me. It's the only answer for me. You say, well, my home life was good, so I don't need Jesus like you do. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> you know. Um, I don't think it's about heaven or hell. I don't think the Father is hoping a bunch of people go to heaven and, uh, and not too many people go to hell. I, what I mean by that is I don't think that's where his focus is. And I think where his focus is, much of Christianity has found something else. They're determined to know whatever that comes along. And, you know, well, this is the latest teaching in church and this is the latest thing, you know. and. Um, you know, this is the latest move of God. Well, Christ and him crucified, folks, is not a move of God. It's not a move of God. It's God's very heart for his son. So anyway, we're done. Let's pray. Father, I sense your spirit. I sense that you sent the dove to write. It's almost as if there is this altar and there are these fowls of the air flying around and, and you even risked the dove and flew him in the midst of the fowls to reach our hearts. How beautiful are you? 
How incredibly beautiful are you? Worthy of all glory. Worthy of all praise. Father, we just thank you that you did, as it were, send your dove tonight. But we, I pray for us, Father, that this would not just be another teaching that we say, wasn't that a great night or wasn't that a horrible night or well, that was boring, Father, but we, we move into your heart that we say, Father, if there's something to any of this, if you're trying to reach us and I'm just dull and far away or whatever, then bring me in, bring me in, bring me in. Father, I do believe there is this part that you want us to do of building the altar like you told Abram. There is this part where we have to build it according to the pattern. That's what Moses did. That's what you told him. Build it according to the pattern that you saw on the mount, where we are supposed to build according to the pattern that we see in the word. We are supposed to build our lives upon Christ crucified. We are supposed to build our lives based on an altar. We're supposed to build our words and our thoughts and our motives and our and our lifestyles on, on that which glorifies you by your firstborn son. We're supposed to build that, though. It's You've done it. Jesus, you did it at the cross. It's settled. But it's not settled in us. We can see that, and that's why you tell us. We reckon ourselves dead. We don't just say, well, it's, you know, true there's a reckoning we put it down in the books and we shut the books and say it's settled the reckoning has come and i will walk in it and i will talk of it and i will breathe it as my very breath i will breathe the atmosphere that you breathe father i will I will love your son the way you love. I will love what you love, and I will hate what you hate. So, Father, may the Holy Spirit not just be dismissed tonight after we're done here, but maybe he, maybe he can follow us home. Maybe he can speak to us in our car, when we're going to work, or when we're doing things, when we're walking, when we're, whatever we're doing, Father, that the dove, the Holy Spirit, the precious Holy Spirit, oh God, we will not blaspheme him. Oh, we will love him, and we will, we will deeply desire his presence not just in some sort of a service, worship service, where the Spirit will make us feel better or make us dance or sing. But we will love him because he's going to be the one who's going to truly reveal Jesus to us. And may I say it, Father, to reveal your heart to us is to reveal Jesus to us. He is your very heart, the apple of your eye. He is that to you. We want to know this crucified lamb. We want to know him the way you want us to know him, not the way that we could grasp something and feel comfortable that we've got it. But like Paul, ever, 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 ever beating off the fowls of the air, ever driving off anything, that tries to turn our focus, including prayer, to, to take it off of the altar as our prayer, rising as sweet incense to you and make it our words based on our life and our needs instead of, instead of what you understand to be true prayer. And you even said in the book of Revelation, the prayers of the saints, Father, they're like sweet incense that rise. Well, that comes from the burning of the altar of incense, the burning up of that form 
that material form of incense, turning it into given, given, burned up life that you smell as a sweet savor and you have it sitting right in front of the veil when it's rent. All of that flows in unto you. So, Lord, we love you. Father, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Spirit of God, we love you. Don't let us go. Keep us going. Keep us going. Keep us moving. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.